Hey everyone, it's me Shimon and welcome to episode 17 of yet another tech podcast. This week I'm joined by Miriam Chuar from Mobile Tech Podcast. We'll be discussing about Computex, WWDC, dual screen laptops, in display selfie cameras and much much more. So hop along for the ride, this is going to be really really interesting. So for folks who might not know about you, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh hi, I'm Miriam, Miriam Jouar. Um my handle online is Tankerl, T-N-K-G-R-L, uh, mostly on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, let's see, I'm a longtime tech journalist. I used to work at Engadget, that's what a lot of people know me for. But I have a podcast called the Mobile Tech Podcast. So I do podcasts all the time. Every week I have a guest on. I should have you on sometimes. That would be um, sweet. Speaking of. <laughs> yep. And uh, so, you know, it's a podcast about mobile technology called the Mobile Tech Podcast, mobiletechpodcast.com. You should subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, we're on all the big platforms, Google, Apple, Pocket Cast, Overcast, TuneIn Radio, Spotify. You have no excuses. <laughs> I'm holding you personally responsible for joining my podcast all of you who are listening um but also i have a youtube channel youtube.com slash miriam joar like my full name spelled out if you don't know how to spell that go to my twitter you'll see my full name so at tankerl t-n-k-g-r-l like the comic book character without the vowels and that's it all right that is great okay so what's the current i do this every week you know? <laughs> yeah you go i do it at the end of my show but i do it every week. oh sweet Okay, so uh, yeah. what are the devices you're using right now, like your current daily driver? Well, my daily driver is always a Pixel or a Nexus. Like my, you know, I'm lazy. See, <laughs> this is the thing. When you when you get about 52 phones to review every year, one a week, oh, yes. <laughs> you get lazy. So you, you start having like, okay, there are there's a phone that has everything on it and you don't want to have to change it every, you know, too much so you do it i keep it for like a year six months mm -hmm. um and then there is the phones you're reviewing like you're intensely reviewing mm -hmm. and those you know you put most of your apps on there and you put like a sim and you try it out and you use it and it's serious right and then there's phones you get that are not very important you don't have to write a review or something you just want to talk about them on the podcast or something right and um because I do some freelance review work right i write for some publications like geek spin and, and others and so um so you basically, you know, I always have a bunch of phones on me. Like I wear cargo pants, so I usually have like four pockets. You know, I mean, if I don't count the rear pockets, because I like to keep those empty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have my wallet in my rear pocket with the chain. And then I got like, you know, four pockets. I got two pockets in front and then two pockets on the sides of the legs, you know, because they're cargo pants. So I, I generally carry like, I try to carry like three or four phones because I, I'm, I'm a very indecisive person, <laughs> right? So... So whatever the latest three or four phones are that are kind of like have arrived, well, maybe three phones, because then I have one, which is my daily driver. So to answer your question, right now, the week of whatever it is, June 3rd, 2019, mm -hmm. I am wearing a pair cargo pants with four phones. I've got my Pixel 3 XL, which is my daily driver, for better or for worse. I have a lot of issues with that phone, but I love it as well. Yeah. I've got a OnePlus 7 Pro. Mm -hmm in my other pocket in front. And then on the side pockets, I have um, uh, Honor 20 Pro and I have a uh, Huawei P30 Pro. Great. That's right now. <laughs> Tomorrow, ask me again, because I have also in my rotation right now, I have a Galaxy S10 Plus. I have an LG G8. I have, I guess it's G8 ThinQ, but I hate that. Yeah. So it's just going to be LG G8, yeah, okay? Let's not say Don't argue you. with me, anybody. <laughs> Nobody can argue. It's just G8. Okay, so then I have, uh, I also have uh, a regular P30. Let's see, what do I have? Oh, I have a Pixel 3a. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, I'm trying to think. I think that's it right now that I kind of like still in rotation in use. The, the Honor 20 Pro has to go back because they want it back because of pre-production. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the whole Huawei apocalypse, yeah. uh, they it's the first time they've said, you, you need to send back now. And I'm like, oh, hold your horses, slow down, what's going on? And they're like, no, please send it back. So I have to like back it up and send it back. Oh, okay. And then, uh, I don't know what's coming. I have, I have some stuff coming. Some of it I can talk about, some of it I can't talk about. The one I can talk about is the Mi, Mi Mix 3, so that's coming. Yeah. Uh, the regular, not the 5G, just the old one. Like, you know, we don't get Xiaomi in the US very well, so I have to wait sometimes. And then I'm um, trying to think what else I'm getting. 
I've requested a Zenfone 6. I'm waiting for that. I've requested a Moto Z4. I'm waiting for that. Mm -hmm. And I've requested... Ah, uh, something else I require. I can't write. I'm losing track. There's too many phones. Yeah, too many phones these days. So that's basically it. That's answering your question. All right, that is great. That is great. So even recently, I had to turn back my Pixel 3 I to Google folks. And I'm like, oh man, <laughs> I miss it so much. The, the whole experience, like, sure, I faced some bugs as well, especially the one where I clicked some photos and went back to gallery. The photos weren't there, but I found them the next day. Ah. <laughs> I think this is weird, but yeah, I love the phone nonetheless. Did you face any such problems? That is problems? a very well-known bug, isn't it? Yeah. I've never had this problem on my Pixel 3 XL. So what kind of problems are you facing on your Pixel? Mostly memory and slowness. I ran out of RAM all the time. Okay, so th that didn't happen with me. Like somehow that RAM issue didn't happen with me. I just feel like 4 gigabytes is just, it's just not enough, you know? I like to run a lot of heavy apps, like a lot of Google apps at the same time. Like my calendar, my email, my, you know, and I copy and paste between them and stuff like while I'm listening to a podcast. Like, you know, it's just like, I just really multitask and you, you can tell it struggles. Sometimes it has to restart apps. True. Um, and sometimes even the music stops playing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a nightmare. Um, and, and the biggest issue, like I haven't, you know, done a factory reset since I got the phone, like at the Google event, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, in, what is it, was it October, November? Yeah, October. So I've been using it since then. And, and so it's slowing, you know, it's doing like what Pixels do every year, which is like they slow down about six months in. <laughs> and I think that's the file system issue. And like I clear the cache and everything, but it's, um, it definitely doesn't feel fast. It never did feel fast. But it does feel slower now. Maybe it's just subjective. Maybe it's simply that I have a OnePlus 7 Pro. I have a P30 Pro. These phones are super fast. Uh, OnePlus 7 Pro is right? amazingly fast. Right? So maybe because of that, I'm like, okay, it's like subjective. Maybe it feels slower than it was in October, but really it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing to think about is that, you know, the reality is... I love what, um, not Huawei, well, Huawei is doing a good job, but I love what OnePlus is doing with the, I have a 12 gigs of RAM version of the OnePlus 7 Pro. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like overkill, I'm like, I probably don't need more than six. Eight is nice, but 12 is silly, right? Even 10. Yeah. So, but then I realized, you know, they're doing something really smart and Huawei is doing that too, in honor. They're both, they're all doing that. Mm -hmm. Is They create a RAM disk, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they put the apps in it. Yes. That was really the one you do the most. Yeah. So guess what happens? It loads up quickly. You hit that app button and it's instantly there. Yes. And that is the most amazing thing ever. Yes. Like I exactly. feel that that's a productivity boost for me all the time. Mm -hmm. And some people were confused. They were like posting screenshots of RAM usage and saying, "Why in the world is RAM being used so much?" And then they realized, "Oh, that's the RAM boost function that is." Working in the background. Yeah, so the RAM Boost is just a fancy name for RAM disk, guys. This has yeah. been around forever. When we were playing with PCs in the 1980s, I'm, I'm old, I'm really old. So when we were playing around with PCs in the 1980s and MS-DOS, we would create RAM disks to put our apps in them, like our programs, to speed them up and run them faster. Because mm -hmm. the hard disks were very slow. They still are. <laughs> Well, comparatively oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. today, yeah. they're much faster. But, but yeah, of course, that's why you use SSDs. Mm -hmm. But RAM disks are a clever trick, and they only really work for a very narrow band of, of, of applications. And, and what I mean by that, not I'm saying using the word application here, but I mean they're used for a different, you know, for kind of a very narrow purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean application as purpose, not application as program. Mm -hmm. And so you can use them for stuff that doesn't take too much space and needs to be accessed really, really fast. So apps are a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, system system stuff is, is a good idea as well to cache in RAM. Correct. But, you know, um, yeah, I mean, this is good. So that's why you want RAM. If you're, buy, if you're buying your shopping for a phone out there, mm -hmm. buy, get a phone with more RAM. Yeah, that's my definitely. <laughs> as a matter of coincidence, literally today at 12... PM my time, one plus seven is going on sale and I'm definitely buying one. It's cheap. Oh, you it's really cheap. Yeah, it's great. It's a, I mean, look, it's a great phone. Mm -hmm. um, it's big. If, I hope you don't like small phones if you're listening, all your listeners, because if you like small phones, you're not going to like the one plus seven. Pro. It's the size of a Note 9. Yes. It's big. 
<clears throat> and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, OnePlus 7 isn't coming to US, that's right? Not the 7, yeah, the regular, there's no point because in that, it's only a hundred dollar difference. Americans are not very price sensitive. They buy their phones subsidized, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why we all buy flagships all the time. I mean, I'm not an American. I mean, I am an American. I have a citizenship, but I am. I'm. I have three nationalities, so I'm. I'm not. I wasn't born in the U.S. So I, you know, Americans are not. Some of them are not very smart. They don't look at their budget. They don't look at the money they spend, and so they don't notice when they go to the carrier operator store and they buy a Samsung Galaxy S10 or an iPhone, and they spend, you know, a lot of money, but spread over two years. So they don't they don't look at it and they're like oh yeah whatever my monthly payment is whatever it is mm -hmm. and they don't they don't really care so if you were in that boat right if you were like that if you're in that position w would you care would you not really you know would like if you if it doesn't matter to you w would you buy like a mid-range phone no no why would you <laughs> no. you'd buy like the best of the best yeah yeah correct because at monthly it makes a little very little difference it's like oh it's five dollars more a month that's the price of a coffee in san francisco you know <laughs> true I'm serious. Like yeah. so, it's all a matter of perspective. Now, of course, um, not everybody's in that position. People, some people are smart with their money. Mm -hmm. Some people are smart and they don't want the carrier bloatware, the operator software installed, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't want a phone that can't be used with other SIMs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they they buy unlocked and they spend more money and and maybe they don't have a thousand dollars or seven hundred fifty dollars. And then they would want to spend $500 on a OnePlus 7 instead of OnePlus 7 Pro. But there's so few of these people in the US, it doesn't make sense for, for OnePlus to spend all the marketing and distribution and, and you know, all the costs, all the overhead of bringing that phone to the US. You understand? Yeah, I agree. And that's basically what it's about. But in, in India, it makes perfect sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of my listeners and YouTube, uh, you know, uh, viewers are from India. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really interesting to hear their perspectives. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously I travel the world a lot, but I don't spend time in India. So it's really interesting to hear everybody's take, right? Yes. So I appreciate that. And I want to thank everyone for listening. You know, one fine day you should come and visit India. That would be really awesome. I, I will, but for me, it's really like a lot of my travel is sponsored, right? I, I don't pay for it, yeah, so yeah. it's like whatever happens, happens, you know? Yeah. Um, if you know a company in India that wants to fly me out, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be great. We need to start a convention in India. I do a lot of public speaking, so I'm a speaker, right? People hire me to speak. So if you want me to come and speak at your conference in India, just let me know. Like, I'm not saying you, mm -hmm. I'm saying your audience. If somebody's on the show listening, Yes. And you want me to come over, like, I'll do it. Just just fly me out, put me up, you know, and I'm happy to go. And I'll speak at your conference for an hour. <laughs> you know, no problem. I got lots to talk about. I, I'm, I'm full of opinions. This is great. <laughs> okay, <laughs> talking about flying out, how was your trip to Computex? How was the whole experience? Oh, Computex is fun. You know, I, I go there every year. It's been like, I think my, this was like my 10th or something, maybe my 11th. I don't know. Oh, it's nice. a, long, a, long, a lot of Computexes. Mm -hmm. um, I've skipped some, so it's not like all of them. But um, Taiwan is a wonderful place. People are super friendly. The food is delicious. I agree. <laughs> um, I love Taiwan. So I fell in love the first time I went to Computex years ago. And now I try to go every year, at least once. And, um, and so Computex was uh, very nice that way. But if you are asking me about the show, it felt a little slow. Like, like I feel that with this current situation right now, with the politics in the world around trade, mm -hmm. you know, all the BS that our stupid president is, you know, all the drama that he's creating. Yeah. Um, that people are very guarded, you know, they're keeping the, you know, I say people, I mean companies, you know, people who run companies, mm -hmm. they're keeping their cards close to their chest and they're not, they're, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? How is the global trade going to evolve? How are things going to go? Are we safe in the sense of, in a business sense, right? So people, I think, have been a little shy to make a lot of noise at Computex. And that's what it felt like. Even as Seuss who is usually very, you know, crazy over the top with their products, didn't really have too much to show, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and overall it was you know the american companies didn't show up like i mean qualcomm was there had a press conference but that, intel of course you know they all had press con but they weren't at the show like there was no booth mm -hmm. for dell or hp you know That's i mean they don't come every year but usually they, they do at least show up like hp wasn't there at all oh dell had a press conference intel had a press conference um let's see who else microsoft i think had a press conference mm, i, I, didn't I, I, I don't it. think so AMD had one. Okay, I thought I thought they originally had one planned, but they canceled it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. who who cancels a press conference? Yeah. <laughs> Something's going on. So, it's weird. Um, and it's not like it's you know it's Taiwan. It's not China, right? It's mm. a different country. So, uh, I don't know what it was. I felt it felt weird. It felt calm, quiet, mm -hmm. and I said a, 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 people kind of felt like they were kind of wait and see attitude you know oh, I about what was going on mm -hmm. and that's sad and i because it stifles innovation you know mm -hmm. i agree yeah so um like out of all the devices and other experiences you had what were the three like devices which really stood out to you like hey this is amazing and i can't wait to get my hands on it well the biggest thing was qualcomm in my opinion for me at least you know as an ultra mobile you know worker mm -hmm somebody who's traveling all the time and works on mobile devices all the time. I, I love my laptops, I have a Mac, I also have some PC laptops, um, but I want to have, a, like I want an ARM-based laptop. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I, I'm really hoping Apple comes up with a MacBook, uh, like a, you know, an ARM-based, ultra-thin, ultra-light, always connected, ultra-long battery life Mac. And out, and that's kind of happening already on the Windows side of the world with Qualcomm and Lenovo and Samsung and HP and other partners, mm -hmm. ASUS, who have worked with Qualcomm over the years to make Snapdragon-based PCs that are always on, always connected, um, you know, have great battery life, have LTE connectivity. And so the big news at, for Qualcomm at, uh, at Computex was that they are, well, they launched a chip in December at their at their uh, what's it called their developer not developer but their tech summit mm -hmm. there's like a tech summit they do in in December Qualcomm mm -hmm. in Hawaii yeah, they yeah. launch a new chip there called the Snapdragon 8 CX which is basically like a Snapdragon 855 but optimized for laptops mm -hmm. so it's a chip that's even faster and even you know can accommodate faster storage and more RAM and and you know it's, it's very power efficient but basically it's optimized for that application for running Windows on ARM mm -hmm. and it's um it's coming soon to some laptops from, from Lenovo and other companies but the big news here is that obviously you know this is Qualcomm so the HCX chip supports 5G right mm -hmm. with uh, an external modem called the X55 mm -hmm. and so the news was that sa they, they showed a prototype of a 5G laptop made by Lenovo running the Snapdragon 8 CX. Um, and uh, so that's coming soon, uh, probably early next year, maybe late this year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for certain markets, I think it's going to make a big difference because, uh, you know, if you want to be productive, 5G is going gonna, is gonna to be faster. So, um, you know, right now you, you get good performance on 4G LTE if you're in, you know, in a good reception area, but in a poor reception area, it falls apart. 5G is going to be great when you're in a good reception area and feel like 4G when you're in a poor reception area. So I think it's going to be a bonus for in, in those markets that support it. Got it. Um, and then the, the other big news is they showed us, they, they showed us side by side an HCX prototype laptop running uh, some of the Windows software some of it emulated, some of it native, mm -hmm. um, versus a Core i5 laptop, you know, generic um, PC laptop, mm -hmm. like Intel laptop. Um, and it was faster, much faster. Wow. So um, the benchmarks were, they weren't like just synthetic benchmarks, you know, like, uh, you know, Geekbench or yeah. something. They were like PC Mark 10, which is a new benchmark mm -hmm. that actually runs the actual applications in like a kind of an automated way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like opening Word and copying and pasting some text, inserting a photo, going to Premiere, editing some video, you know, going to Photoshop CS and editing some photos or Lightroom or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a real use case scenario type um, benchmark. So they ran that on an HCX at the same time as they ran it on a on an i5 and the HCX was like something like 20% faster and used less battery life doing it, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's the future, I think. That's where we're going, you know, at least for ultra portable uh, laptop type computing, like full, no, no, re no, not reduced OS, like real, like full desktop experience, right? Yeah, not, not like Windows um, 10S. <laughs> Yeah, this is not Windows 10s. This is the real Windows. And as I said, if Apple comes out with a MacBook that's ARM-based, which I, I think is the next logical step for them, uh, it'll be the same thing. It'll have to run emulated for some apps, but eventually everybody will recompile their apps and it'll just work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Apple's done that transition twice now. They've gone from 68,000 to PowerPC and then from PowerPC to Intel. Mm -hmm. They can go back from Intel to ARM. It's no problem. They'll do it. Um, so I think that's the future. We're going to see laptops that are thinner, lighter, faster than what we have today with almost no bezel uh, and with always connected, you know, like you turn them on, you don't have to worry where you are. You just, you just, you have 5G or 4G, right? Whatever's available automatically. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you pay for the connectivity. But if you're, you know, like a power user or a business user, it doesn't make any, it doesn't matter, right? Like you, it's going to be a part of your your operating cost True. so i think for for businesses it makes a lot of sense and for consumers we eventually it'll come down in price and one of the things that qualcomm uh i had don mcguire the qualcomm executive on my podcast this past week episode 133 of the mobile tech podcast sorry 113 episode 113 of the mobile tech podcast you should listen to it and he actually surprised us by by you know hinting that there will be a cheaper version of this hcx chip announced uh, in Hawaii mm -hmm. this year wow. uh, for three hundred dollar laptops, right? That is right now the HCX is really more like for premium laptops, like eight hundred dollars and up, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that means that they're trying to bring you know the economies of scale. They're trying to bring this down mm -hmm. to uh, to a more affordable price point so that we can have Chromebooks and Windows ten machines running on ARM, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, so that's the, that's one thing. Okay. So if I get it correctly, HCX is targeting say. Intel i5 chips? Yeah. Okay. So that's great. Yeah. So so the downgrade version of 86 would be aiming at i3, I guess, which will be like not much intensive apps, but yeah. That, well, you never know. This is this downgraded doesn't necessarily mean it, it downgraded the downgraded part is cost, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It it's a year later, remember? Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is there's probably going to be a new chip for the high end announced mm -hmm. and then you know, the new chip that's in the mid-range is going to be as fast. It's like the Snapdragon 830, uh, sorry, 730 today is almost as fast as an 845 last year. Yeah. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. So I, I don't think you have to worry about performance. Mm -hmm. um, and remember, this is the first 7 nanometer PC chip, right? Mm -hmm. The HCX. So it's full 7 nanometer. Nobody else has done a seven nanometer chip, right? Now AMD has caught up with their. Uh, well, AMD that was an announcement at, that was announced at Computex, but yeah. you know they did it six months ago. Yeah, 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 totally agree. Right, so that was a big news for me. It was Qualcomm, um, and you know uh, the next big thing I think at the show was uh, ASUS made this dual screen crazy ZenBook Pro Duo laptop. That was amazing. Um, yeah, so if you go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Miriam Joir, again, if you want to spell my name, go to my Twitter, Tanker, at Tanker, to look at the name and spell that out. No spaces, just Miriam Joir. Um, there's two videos that you can see for Computex. There is a video showing that benchmark uh, of the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8CX versus the i5. And then there is a video about this ZenBook Pro Duo from ASUS. So what? Th this is a bit weird. Like, the idea is excellent the execution i am not 100 percent happy with mm -hmm. um if you look at your normal laptop right mm -hmm. you have a screen on the top half like if you open it mm -hmm. and then the bottom half you have the keyboard and the trackpad right and usually the keyboard is close to the screen and then you have like um wrist wrist uh you know wrist uh, rests or yeah, whatever you want yeah. to call it spots to put your wrist mm -hmm. and the trackpad between your two your two wrists right mm -hmm. and so you're typing it's comfortable you have a place to rest, rest your arms and then you have a trackpad in the middle so if you're right-handed or left-handed you can use it so that's the standard laptop today even the two-in-ones you know they have like a case mm -hmm. uh, cover that's a type cover or whatever they have an attachment that looks like that mm -hmm. so what Asus did is they did more what you see on the gaming laptops, which you know sometimes for cooling, yes. they move the keyboard to the front of the case, mm -hmm. and closer to the screen they have more airflow, so the 
guts are cooled better and usually they put a track pad on the left side or the right side like um, Razer's done that and, and of course Asus has done that with the ROG laptops um, so um, they did that design and instead of an empty space you know where all the electronics normally are that needs room for cooling they put a second screen there so basically on the top half of the laptop it's full screen and the bottom half close to the main screen is a screen that's half the bottom half of the laptop and then forward towards you is the keyboard with the trackpad on the right now I think it's very cool and I can get into the details of how it works and what it does but the problem I have with it is that there's two problems number one this if this was announced as an ROG laptop or like a studio book which is Asus's brand for like creator machines you know more powerful machines um, that are still very portable but more powerful mm -hmm. um, they would make sense to have this product because um, you know it, it it's a little bigger and heavier so and it has you know it's designed for creators because there's all multi multiple screens and stuff mm -hmm. great idea but the problem here is that by having the keyboard closer to you, you don't have any place to rest your wrist. So the thing comes with a wrist rest in the box that you have to kind of attach to it. Yes. And so why would you carry that, number one? Number two, the trackpad's on the right. Now, I'm right-handed, I don't mind. But if you're left-handed, what are you going to do? You need a mouse or another trackpad. You can't really use that very well. So that's kind of weird to me. And then more importantly, again, all of this would make sense if it was labeled like, uh, you know Zephyrus or ROG or something right mm -hmm. but it's sold as a Zenbook right <laughs> even if it's Zenbook Pro Duo mm -hmm. Pro means obviously high-end mm -hmm. Zenbooks are ultrabooks Zenbooks are the, are the they're the first PC in the world that simu that copied the MacBook Air <laughs> and brought the form factor that we all know today that's called ultrabook to the market a Zen book should not be one inch thick. It's one inch thick. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. It should be, it should not be one inch thick and weigh 10 pounds. It, you know, it, it should be a small and light laptop. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand the branding and I don't understand this execution with the trackpad. What I would have done is I would have stayed Put the trackpad away and then maybe have it slide from underneath like have it in a little slider thing that slides under the keyboard and you pull it out mm -hmm. you know yeah. like and then like the you'd have a rest <laughs> you'd, yeah you'd have like a rest a, a wrist pad wrist rest built into it mm -hmm. it would be cool or it would fold over the keyboard or something like that it would that would have made more sense to me but and but in the form factor that it comes right now because of its weight and size the brick for it the power brick is like the size of an xbox power brick okay wow <laughs> and it's got core i9 it's got uh rtx uh nvidia uh, graphics i mean it's a powerhouse yeah. but my point is it's pretty much the specs of a gaming laptop yes. in a form factor of a gaming laptop but it's called zenbook it just doesn't make any sense now if you can get past the branding and you look at and past the stupid layout with the keyboard and trackpad but but that layout already exists on gaming laptops so again if you know yeah. if you are used to it it's not you can get over that the cool thing is where your keyboard would normally be is a, is a screen and that screen is exactly half the height of the, the main screen and so you basically now have like a screen and a half it's the same resolution 4k on the big major screen 4k at least the width mm. on the bottom half and so everything lines up so you can drag a window and make it you know you can have more vertical space or what you can do is you can divvy up the space have your main screen like you know for your main video uh, and then you can divide the bottom screen into two or three equal size uh, windows basically to run like you know you chat like if you're a, a, a gamer you can have the game on the main screen you could have your uh, discord mm -hmm. uh, in one window your chat in another window uh, and then maybe your uh, uh, a view of your uh, um, you know video that if you're if you're doing like uh, 
uh, you're, you're broadcasting video, right, on mm -hmm. Twitch or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So they, sh they showed all these use cases, you know, video editors having their controls on the bottom half, and they're both touch screens, right? So the main screen and the bottom half screen are, are touch screens. So, mm -hmm. so that's a good idea, right? I, I think the idea is good. Again, the execution is bad. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need a Core i9 for this. I don't need you need. I don't think you need an Xbox brick. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you need two-hour battery life. I don't think it needs to be an inch thick. I think they could have done a better job with the keyboard and trackpad, and then it could be a Z book. But the way it is right now, it should be an ROG or a studio book, and it should be sold as basically a mobile workstation, mobile gaming laptop, mobile gaming rig instead of as a ultra portable, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Agreed. And so that's my beef. Now they make a smaller, cheaper one that doesn't have a touch screen on the main screen and doesn't. So the, the expensive one has an OLED as the main screen, which is a 4K OLED, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then a regular IPS for the second half screen part. Mm -hmm. And they both have touch. And the cheaper one is only like Core i5 or Core i7 and only has MX graphics. And it's thinner and lighter. And it has two IPS panels instead of one OLED, and it's not—I don't think it's 4K, and it's got touch only on the main panel, uh, only on the bottom panel, the the half panel. Mm -hmm. uh, so that one is more like a ZenBook, but it's still pretty thick, right? And that's yeah. kind of the thing that I'm—I was a little kind of put off by. I'm like, why is it even the simpler one thick? And people are like, well, you know, you have two screens. You have the screen at the bottom takes up. I'm like, yeah, but this is ASUS. Like they're. They could have engineered this better. Like, I don't understand. To me, the OLED should be on the bottom half because it's thin, right? Mm, agree. It's thinner than a regular IPS panel. So, I, I don't know. The whole thing is full of... The, the, the thing brought me more questions. Like, I asked more questions after seeing it than I had answers, basically. Oh, <laughs> but, I see. But I like... The, I want to say I like the idea. I just don't feel they did it properly. Who knows? They might come up with an improved version somewhere down the line. Yeah, but then why, why, why make this turd now? <laughs> Agreed. Like, why, why half-ass it, right? Like, why do a half-ass job? Like, I don't like it when people do a half-ass job. It's like, you know, do it right. Like, the, the thing is, they've done it right before. Like, when they came out with the first Zen book, it was it was an ultra book. It was basically a MacBook Air copy, mm -hmm. and and nobody had done that before in the PC world. Yeah, that was pretty fascinating. And to me, like, you know, even last year when they did the ZenBook Pro, not Duo, because the Duo is that new dual screen thing. They did the ZenBook Pro and they put the trackpad became a screen. Remember that? Yeah, yeah I do. Well, that thing is light and thin and ultra portable and still super powerful. So where did the engineering go? I just don't understand it. It's just weird. Maybe they just wanted to scream first and just put it out something and, you know, gather the news cycle. Like, hey, we showcase so and so stuff at Computex. Who knows? Yeah, maybe that's what it was. But look, hey, whatever it is, it's okay. I, I'm not going to complain. No. I, I think that I just have to be critical, right? And I just have to like, it's not for me. A lot of other people loved it. They're like, oh my God, I can't wait to have this. I want it. It's fantastic. <laughs> And I was like, okay, if you want to carry around an Xbox 360 brick <laughs> and, and have a two-hour battery life and weigh 10 pounds in your bag, I think it's great. Yeah, of course. It's, if you're right-handed, <laughs> it's great. It's super awesome. Yeah. yeah. So talking, talking about concepts and all, uh, did you see the videos which came out today or uh, yeah, yesterday about the cameras being under the display of smartphones? Oppo and Xiaomi. I it did. Up. Oppo and Xiaomi, yeah. Um, we're actually going to talk this on my show this week, uh, episode 114, which will be out later this week. Oh, um, but, um, yeah, well, look, I, I've been saying this is going to happen for years now. Like, uh, two years ago, I was like, when the notch started, I was like, well, <laughs> wait till they put the camera under the screen, guys. And everybody's looking at me going, you're crazy? I'm like, ha ha, you don't understand engineering. <laughs> it's going to happen. Trust me, this is trivial. Uh, and people are like, what do you mean it's trivial? It is trivial, guys. The only problem... First of all, OLEDs are pretty thin. Mm -hmm. OLEDs are transparent mostly. Yes. Like that's why you have a fingerprint reader in your display of your OnePlus 7 Pro, guys. Yes. Because it's a camera that shines a light on your finger, okay? Mm -hmm. It already exists. The in-camera, the in -dis under display camera exists. It's your in-display fingerprint reader. Yes. So now we just have to make it better so that instead of scanning a finger that's very close to the glass, it can look through the glass and you know, see, see everything and take a good picture. The challenge is not to put a camera under the OLED display. First of all, this is only going to work with OLED. Mm -hmm. Secondly, 
The challenge is to make a camera that captures enough light going through that display. Because the display, even though it's kind of transparent, I said it's kind of, mm -hmm. it's, I didn't say it's transparent, it's kind of transparent. So you have to make it more transparent, that's one challenge, but you also have to make it so that it can compensate for the loss of light when you do a selfie in low light, right? Mm -hmm. So in daytime, it's gonna be no problem. In low light though, you're gonna start having issues because that you're essentially adding a neutral density filter, right? Mm. To your camera <laughs> by having that display in front of it. So, you know, you're gonna need some very large pixels, some very sensitive and high quality sensors, and some really good optics, a very fast lenses like f over 1.2, f over 1.4. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's expensive and complicated to make. Agreed. At least for a smartphone that costs like two, three hundred dollars, right? Yes. Because you know that within a year, Oppo will have this on a smartphone that costs two to three hundred dollars. <laughs> so True. that is the challenge. The challenge is not that we're getting a camera under the screen. The challenge is that we're going to get a camera on the screen from Oppo in the very soon, and it's going to be in a five hundred dollar phone first, and then within a year, it's going to be in a two hundred and fifty dollar phone. <laughs> That's the challenge, and I am super excited about it. I absolutely think it's the future and you know what's gonna happen is the area where the camera is is gonna go black because you have you can't have light shining in from the edges right mm -hmm. of the of the the camera hole yes because otherwise you're creating some you know basically interference with the the camera and then you know you take a photo and the display goes back on right mm -hmm. that's it it's gonna be magical yeah I'm super pumped about it I can almost guarantee you I'm calling it now <laughs> this is my prediction mm -hmm. One plus eight, maybe the one plus eight T, but or seven T, mm -hmm. whatever. Maybe the, the next, uh, but at least the one plus eight will have that guaranteed. Okay, so last week I had a word with Shimon Kopech, he's the product lead in India uh, for one plus. Yeah. <laughs> he was like hinting like the parts for one plus eight have been ordered already. In the fact that I was just asking about the production cycle or the design cycle of OnePlus 7 Pro. So he was saying like we order components about one or one and a half years prior. So he, like, hey, we're already giving orders for the next one. Like, oh, nice. <laughs> so who knows? Like, So I mean, if, if you it, think about it, I agree with you. And so it's possible it might be the OnePlus 8T, like the mm -hmm. fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. But be because here's the thing. Remember when Vivo showed the Apex concept phone last year? Yeah, I do. Do you remember that? Yes, January, when was it? Like early in the year? Yeah, the CES. CES, yeah. right? Okay. The Apex phone had the pop-up camera for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. Nobody had done that before, right? Mm -hmm. And then we saw it come out on a commercial, like a, a retail unit with the Vivo Nex, Nex. S in the summer, mm -hmm. right? Followed quickly by the Oppo Find X. Mm -hmm. And then, since then, we've got had a half a dozen phones with it, at least. Like, you have a Xiaomi, no Xiaomi, but uh, maybe Xiaomi, I can't remember. But mm. definitely Huawei, uh, Oppo, Vivo, right? Yes. And then OnePlus now with the 7 Pro. So my point is, it's taken a year and a bit to appear on, an, on a OnePlus device. Yes. So this is the concept. We've seen the concept, right? Mm -hmm. Concept device. Yes. It has the in-display camera. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to wait about a year and a little bit. So you're right, it might not make the OnePlus 8. It might not be this time of year. It might be in the summer of next year, so that would appear on a OnePlus in the fall. Mm. So there you go. It's very simple math. Yeah. <laughs> simple indeed. So um, what do you think about the 7 Pro? Like, how was your experience with it so far? I love it. I think it's a great phone. Um, are you spoiled by I the mean, 90 hertz display? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, I think for me, those are the highlights. I, I don't know if you've read my review. If you de haven't, it's on geekspin.co. Um, I mean, obviously, I've reviewed it um, on my podcast. But if you want to read a review, like a 2,000-word review with photo samples and the whole thing, uh, geekspin.co, check it out. The OnePlus 7 re Pro review is my preview there. And and you'll see, for me, the, the standouts are, you know, the things that were traditionally like about OnePlus, right? Performance uh, and, and price, I even even though it's expensive compared to, you know, it's $100 mm -hmm. more than OnePlus 7, mm -hmm. I, still, I still think it's a, it's a deal. I mean, 300 and, sorry, $630 US for the base model, it's incredible. I like agree. people are complaining, but I don't think they understand how smartphone, how the smartphone industry works. Mm -hmm. This is insane for the money, this phone. Exactly. 
But the so, reason, the, but the reason why I'm not opting for seven pro and going with seven instead is because it's too large for my taste. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't like curved screens, so I'd rather have a flat screen on the front. So I'm yeah, like, okay, and you uh, know what? I think that's a very reasonable decision. But the reality is, you know, if you can't, you know, or if maybe it's your budget, like I can understand. Some people are going to say, I don't want to spend that extra hundred dollars. And I, I think getting the seven is a great thing. You get a new fingerprint reader. You get the same CPU. You know, you get the same camera, the main camera. You get a lot of the advantages from the 7 Pro. So uh, it's a great choice. But to me, what I like the 7 Pro is the display. Um, it's, it's 90 hertz. It's the quality of that display. The performance, of course, I already mentioned that. I mean, in every way, especially with 12 gigs of RAM and that RAM disk, um, you know, it's super fast. And then... Of course, there is the uh, cameras, which are finally competitive. I feel that the OnePlus 7 Pro performs as well as the Galaxy S10 Plus or S10, you know? Mm -hmm. It's up there. It's good. It's solid. It's strong. They've done. They've had some issues like, um, you know, they're fixing some bugs. They're, the biggest complaint I had was the softness of the photos taken with the ultra-wide angle. They, they seem to have resolved that in the latest update. Um, and uh, but I think their tele lens is pretty solid, definitely better than Samsung. And the main lens is very good too, uh, especially that that very fast uh, f of 1.6 f stop. So all around, I think it's a solid phone. Battery life is pretty good. Some people are complaining, but I feel like considering you have that crazy 90 hertz quad HD display that needs to be constantly refreshed. I think it's actually very good. I certainly don't feel like battery life is lacking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as good as a P30 Pro, but you know, the P30 Pro has a 1080p display and it's a Kirin 980. It's always going to be better. Yeah. Like, Huawei is a champion of battery life. There's no doubt about that. Um, battery life has never been the strength for, for OnePlus. It's always been performance and price. Yes. And camera has always taken a sec, uh, you know, kind of like a back seat. And for this, for this year, I finally feel that the the OnePlus 7 Pro, the camera is finally competitive. It's like, it's there, it's good. So, and the pop-up camera is cool, and you know, you've got, you know, again, it's a big phone. That's my biggest complaint. It's a big phone. Yeah, it's and, a very big phone. And heavy too, actually. And heavy, and you know, it's like, I don't like, I'm not a big fan of the drawer, you know, like the... <laughs> The, like uh, like in US we get it on T-Mobile US right like mm. it's a uh, partner yeah. uh, operator and um, on the T-Mobile version they have the Google uh, now thing when you slide to the left mm -hmm. you know oh slide to the right to get to the left screen yeah. and and the left screen is not the drawer you can turn on the drawer if you want it's in the settings but by default you get the Google thing and I like the Google thing but on the unlock version you don't get the Google option at all and it drives me nuts because now I have to install. I only the only reason I have to install a new launcher is because I want the Google thing. <laughs> like, I like the OnePlus launcher; it's perfectly fine. I don't want to have to replace it. Why don't you fix that OnePlus? I said that in my review. <laughs> yeah, I would prefer a Google feed over anything any day. Yeah, so there you go. That's my take from the OnePlus Seven in a nutshell. Did the, Did you try the, the uh, Google camera APK on uh, Centro? I have not played with uh, uh, the ports for the Google camera yet, no. I, I, I'm waiting for the Pixel 4 to be released with the 855 optimized camera before I try port it, a port because I feel that there are so many advantages to the ISP on the 855 mm -hmm. that porting the 845 camera doesn't make sense to me. Pixel 4 is going to be amazing. I can't wait for it. I kind of wanted to yeah. hold out till October to buy a new phone. I'm like, no. <laughs> This is go with OnePlus 7 for now and then I'll upgrade again. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, you, honestly, for the price, it's it's, in, it's kind of incredible. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, there's a lot of things that you can be picky about. And that's, you know, that's, it's important to be critical. And I think that, you know, this thing with the drawer, the thing with, um, with the uh, uh, battery life could be better, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, the... The small issue with the camera, they fix that. But I mean, overall, you know, like there's very little to complain about here. And and for the price, it's like, I wish I had a headphone jack, you know? I wish I had a notification light. It doesn't have that either. But at the same time, you know, that's the way things are going. Nobody's putting, I mean, Samsung even stopped putting a notification light on the S10 this year, so. Yeah. And they're going to like you know. remove the headphone jack from Note 10. So there's that. Yeah, that will be the <laughs> beginning of the end, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, talking about like Pixel 4, um, 
Do you think it will have dual cameras this time or they will stick to single camera again? They have to have two cameras at least in the back. I think um, it's not a question of performance, right? Like, I don't think they need two cameras for better pictures. Like, you can do great pictures with one camera. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that already. The problem is versatility, right? Agreed. And that's where I think the OnePlus 7 Pro and the uh, Galaxy S10, the P30 Pro, and even that Honor 20 Pro that I have to return soon are phenomenal because you have a choice of three lenses and they're all very good. Mm. So now you have a choice and variety which is unparalleled, you know? And you can't beat a telephoto. I mean, you, you can apply some smart algorithms to get good quality zoom, especially if you have a large sensor, like the 48 megapixel sensor in the Galaxy S, uh, sorry, on the OnePlus 7 Pro, or, or like the on. 40 megapixel sensor on the P30 Pro. Mm -hmm. You can use that to your advantage to get really good zoom, digital zoom, but you're never gonna be able to beat a dedicated zoom lens. And it's the same with ultra wide. You, 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 you need to move back. I mean, you, yeah, you have no choice. So versatility is something people are looking for. And I think the other problem, and this is my biggest gripe with Google every year, like as much as I'm a Nexus and, and Pixel primary user, for me, it's because I want the pure Google experience, but I'm starting to be very annoyed with them because they're not delivering premium hardware. Mm. Right? If you look at the Pixel 3 XL today, it's almost, what, nine months old, eight mm. months old, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not, it doesn't even compare to, it doesn't, it's not even competitive. Like, like a Galaxy S9 is a better choice in terms <laughs> of hardware. Yeah, at least it looks better in my opinion. Like S9 Plus with the dual camera. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's like it's that bad. It has not aged well. That notch is totally crazy ugly. Oof, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and and I mean, yes, the design is, is refined, it's glass and, and aluminum, it's nicely made. But it just doesn't have like if you look at what OnePlus is doing now and what Huawei's doing now, what Honor's doing now, what you know, even Apple, like it it's not in the same league, the hardware. Mm -hmm. Right? And then put four gigs of RAM, like, what? <laughs> okay, like, that was a mistake when it was launched. Yes. Like, so what I want to see is Google say, okay, we're going to make a $1,000 phone and not hold any punches, right? Because, look, they now have a Pixel 3a that costs $399. So they have that market corner, mm. right? And in the U.S., a lot of people, and, and you're, I, I think your audience is primarily in India, mm -hmm. so... You are probably going to shake your head and say, Miriam, why are you talking about the Pixel 3a with such enthusiasm? It's $399. That's a lot of money for what it is. You're forgetting that you're not paying for the hardware. I can buy a $200 phone from Oppo that is a million times better hardware than a Pixel 3a. Mm -hmm. Right? I, agree. I want to make that 100% clear. But that Oppo phone is a piece of S compared <laughs> to the Pixel 3a when it comes to experience and camera. I agree. Totally agree. Okay? Yes. So, you know, you have to understand that in this, in, in this market, in the European market, in markets where we don't have readily $200 Chinese phones available that are amazing, that a Pixel 3a makes a lot of sense for $399. Mm -hmm. Okay. So based on that, let's go back to the to the Pixel 4. And and what I'm trying to say is that I wish that Google would say, okay, let's not skimp on anything. Let's make a great Pixel 4 that costs $999, that has a beautiful 6.4 inch Quad HD AMOLED display, that has three or two or three beautiful cameras in the back, two or three beautiful cameras in the front, and you know, has just that really premium look and feel to it that is something you find on a Samsung phone or, or even a OnePlus now and 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 on, a, on an iPhone and brand that as a Pixel, you know? And yes, you're not gonna sell as many. Doesn't matter, you can sell a million 3As, especially by then the 3A will be 299 discounted, you know? Yeah, exactly. So what, what really excites me about Pixel 4 is uh, the design team which Google bought from HTC is working on Pixel 4 ever since Pixel 2 time. So it's been in the works since two years, so I wonder what amazing thing they do, because when I visited the HTC's design factory in Taiwan, oh my god, 
the designs they come up with is amazing but the top level management level they just, they just mess up everything and they just don't release those designs or somewhat i don't know no i agree that's my concern with htc i mean they're dead anyways n- you know hopefully <laughs> now it's yeah now it's now it's google but i'm i'm like i'm not convinced that they are the best designers in the world i think that not the best but i, I would say they pretty unique and they just go out of their way to design something else but that's the problem the problem is that they are maybe very creative designers but google's not going to be on board <laughs> for crazy designs so they're going to be in the same boat as they were when they worked at HCC you know where the management doesn't want to take the risks mm-hmm. so i'd rather work i'd rather see a design team that works with google here like that is understands that Google wants to keep things simple and pretty conservative but pushes the spec sheet mm-hmm. and the build quality and the materials even if the design itself is pretty traditional i mean honestly you know the OnePlus 7 Pro if it wasn't that beautiful shiny matte finish blue color it would be a pretty boring design <laughs> it would just look like a 60 in my opinion i mean you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. it's not that weird or different or unusual of a design as a pop-up camera many people have done that before mm-hmm. it's it's well made and that's important the materials are really nice but it's the colors that distinguish themselves that's why Oppo and Vivo make such cool looking phones mm-hmm. and Huawei look at the P30 Pro in what is it that breathing crystal oh, color that's the one so I have good. it is absolutely incredible <laughs> right yeah uh now Google might not do those crazy colors but I want them to focus on specs and materials build quality even if the designs are a little traditional. I don't need some weird design from from HTC here. I want something that can stand its ground and be competitive for a year from the release date. So no skimping on RAM, no skimping on number of cameras, no skimping on battery size, no skimping on processor. Like give us the whole shebang Google. Yeah, a max out pixel that would be nice. That's what I want. And even if it's 999, I don't care, okay? <laughs> Because it's not an issue on this market. It's not an issue. Nobody cares that your phone is $1000. Everybody's making a $1000 phone here. Do you miss the um wedge design from Pixel 1 where there was no camera bump but it was thick from the top and then thinner in comparison at the bottom man i didn't like the pixel 1 design i thought it was boring and and mostly it was because it was so full of bezel oh so bad from the front right yeah. and and i mean you know it was see that one thing i have to say is i think the pixel 1 was felt and looked more premium than the 2 or the 3 <laughs> Yeah, so somewhat yes. But materials and build quality were better. But at least on the at least yeah, on on the on the two of them, yeah, because they're both made by HT. But I feel like they was let down by the specs again. Yes. Yeah. So what we need is we need that kind of a boring design. Mhm. But we need it with all the beats the best specs, right? So we need a, you know, uh like a a punch hole display, you know, we need or or even an a, a bezel is display with uh, some other selfie camera set up and that's never going to happen with Google. So I'm calling it now it's going to either if it has a notch I'm going to scream. <laughs> But if it has a do uh, like a a do drop or a pull punch I will be less screamy. <laughs> <laughs> um and then it has to have, you know, a really refined look and feel to it. It has to feel when i put it next to an iphone and i touch both of them i need to feel like yep these are the same mm-hmm. you know when i touch a galaxy s10 plus and i touch an iphone 10s max together and one in each hand they are beautiful phones they're beautifully made you know there's nothing to complain about and they feel premium in hand yeah they do and even the oneplus 7 pro has that oh yes and so so if OnePlus can do it for six hundred and thirty dollars. I'm sure Google can do it for a thousand dollars, but I don't want them to skimp on that, and I don't want to skimp on specs. They can be as boring as they want for everything else. <laughs> I agree. Since we're talking about like colors, about Oppo, I just sent you an image. So this was being circulated yesterday. Like someone wiped their Oppo phone with a wet cloth, I guess, and the whole covering from the back just came off. Oh goodness, let me have a look at that. I, n- I somehow don't have TweetDeck running, so let me just bring So, normally like these colors are underneath the glass, 
I don't know what happened with this particular Oppo smartphone. I think it's F11 Pro. I'm not sure. But the whole covering just came well, off. It's the, F, the FP11 Pro is not glass, though, is it? Mm, it's plastic. Yeah, so that's the problem. But yeah, but still, the coloring portion would be underneath the plastic, right? Not sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, still, it just I came off. feel like... <laughs> Interesting. It's really interesting. Honestly, that feels to me like they opened it up and peeled the plastic inside and then lied about it. I don't know. <laughs> Might be, but then that would be quite some trouble, you know. Like, I mean, if it's a plastic cover, it could be that this is a, this is the paint and it's chipping off, you know. Mm -hmm. So the person who and posted it, a, it was in some weird it Facebook. It could be a group. defect. It just could be a manufacturing defect. I mean, it, like you look, you've seen you know cars bumpers that are plastic. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're not painted properly, they chip, right? Yes. So I think it just could be a bad batch or something. But look, I mean, that's not going to happen on a glass phone, okay? Because the glass, all the stuff is in the inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you see the matte finish, that's actually etched on the outside. So that's actually laser etched, mm -hmm. right? So they make the glass frosty by shining a laser. In fact, today was the Apple event here in, in the U.S. Yes. And um, because I'm still on Monday time, mm -hmm. Monday evening. And, and so... We had, uh, you know, they announced the new monitors for the Mac Pro, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the options you have is, is a micro etched uh, matte display. And that's actually, instead of using a coating, they're actually laser etching the glass, just like OnePlus does on the back of the matte finish of the OnePlus 7 Pro. Mm -hmm. It's pretty trippy so, how it looks matte, but when you hold it, it's glossy. Correct. Yeah, it's very interesting. Because it's microscopic. Mm -hmm. It's like optical level, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The scratches are, no scratches, the, the pits that they're creating with the laser are so small, mm -hmm. you just can't feel them, but they affect the, uh, op it's like, you know, when you look at a lens and you don't see any scratches, but then you look at the same lens with a microscope and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> there's all these scratches everywhere. So, uh, talking about WWDC, it just happened. Um, I'm not an Apple user, but still, like, did anything, you know, surprise you at the event? Well, I mean, no, I, I think... Well, okay. I think it was a good event. It felt like it had a lot of meat. I like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like they didn't skimp. You know, that's that's good news. Um, but remember, this is a developer conference. It's not a hardware announcement conference. So it's not like, you know, the Apple event in, for the iPhone or the iPads or whatever in the fall. Um, so what's exciting to me is, of course, the Mac Pro. You know, I mean, I'm a Mac user, but I'm not a power user, right? Like, I, I'm just a you know, journalist. I don't need, like, a 28-core Intel Xeon machine. <laughs> True. <laughs> but as a nerd, as an engineer, because before I worked as a journalist, I worked as an engineer. I made video games professionally for 20 years, right? So I, as I told you, I'm, I'm very old. Like, I was around computers in the 70s, so, you know. Um, so I was, I was, you know, I was in video games and I needed these powerful machines when I made games as a coder. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate a nice, powerful PC today. You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of Visual Studio. If I write code, it's usually on a PC in Visual Studio mm -hmm. um, and sometimes on Xcode on a Mac. But what I love about these new Macs is that basically Apple said, F you PC world. <laughs> We're going to show you how to make a PC. And the last time they did that, it was a trash was, can. <laughs> no, the trash can, I think I liked it because I was a, I'm a Mac person. I'm a technology nerd. But I think the trash can didn't go over that well with a lot of power users. I think the original G5 or what became then the, um, the Intel-based Mac Pro, right? The one that looked like a cheese grater, the original cheese grater the one. The original cheese grater. That showed the world how to make a powerful PC when the G5 came out yes. and now we're seeing that again and I'm excited by that because it's like it's like you look at the prices and you go this is crazy but then you remember it's this is not made for individual people mm -hmm. this is not made for you and me <laughs> this is not made for gamers this is made for professionals like people who have a budget and they don't care they're going to spend the money because they need the fastest and the best because they're musicians they're video editors they're photo editors they're people who have already made it right mm -hmm. they have achieved their professional success and they have the finances to do this or they're big corporations who have creative people on their staff and need to spend the money like the film industry mm -hmm. right people who buy red cameras 
Mm, like yeah. Marquez is going to buy one of those, you know it. Of course, <laughs> of course he's right? going to buy so one. So my point is, that's what I love about this, is that this is what happens when you don't look at cost and you make the best thing you can make. I think I, I think I read somewhere that the top of the line, the new Mac Pro would cost $35,000. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Nobody knows for sure because they only give us the entry level price, mm -hmm. just $6,000. And that's for a bare bones machine. Mm -hmm. But I am sure there will be configs that with a display or two displays will be $50,000. Oh, and, right. and, you know, a display is $5,000 for the regular and $6,000 for the, the mat with the laser etching. So. And that's without the stand. The stand itself is one thousand dollars. Yeah, I saw that. All oh, this stand and looks that's incredible. The, and that's to me the ultimate f you, <laughs> right? It's Agreed. like, oh, you want the stand, sir? Well, it's another nine hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> but it's the best stand in the entire world. Okay, and so. And so I like this because it's Apple again with no limits. It's Apple showing the rest of the industry. Look at what we can do when price is no object, when we really go nuts. And there's nothing better about Apple when, as when they go nuts, right? <laughs> Remember when the iPhone 10 came out and we were all like, oh my God, a thousand dollar phone, that's nuts. <laughs> well, guess what? It was so nuts, the phone was freaking awesome. Yes. I right? Guess. Yes. And so that's when Apple is at its best. Apple innovates when they have no restrictions. And I love when Apple innovates because it drives the rest of the industry crazy. Mm -hmm. And it pushes them to do the same thing at half the price. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen? This is only good for you guys. Anyone who is listening I says, I cannot afford a $6,000 Mac. This is ridiculous. Why well, I can build a PC just as good for $5,000 or four or $3,000. Shut up. <laughs> This is not for you. What is going to happen is that in a year, you'll be able to build the same PC for $3,000. You'll be able to buy one from HP or Dell or Lenovo for three or $4,000. That's almost as good. It won't look as good. It won't feel as nice. It won't run Mac OS. But then you'll benefit. Yes. Do you understand? That's innovation. Yeah. When McLaren makes a new car, nobody can afford it. <laughs> but True. eventually that technology goes down to other cars that you can afford and that's innovation and that's why I'm super excited about the Mac Pro even though it's the craziest insanest thing ever you know agree agree totally agree so I think that's the big news the other big news I think is iPad OS oh yes yes the, the buy I'm very excited about that I'm still a little shy here because I'm I don't like iOS. Yeah, same. And that's the only reason I don't like using an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Not because I don't like the hardware, but because I don't like the software. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm really hoping that I'm not disappointed when I start using iPadOS because I want to see something that's much closer to a Chromebook experience. Mm -hmm. And apparently the new Safari provides that. The new multitasking provides it. They have a new files app that actually lets you read SD cards and thumb drives and hard drives. About damn time. <laughs> yes, and lets you, um, you know, uh, basically connect to Samba shares and all that stuff that you do when you're a pro. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about that because I'm not, I've never said that I wouldn't use an iPad for work. But right now, the reason I can't use an iPad for work is because these are things I require. Mm -hmm. True. So I'm using a Mac instead. You know, but nothing says I couldn't use an iPad. It's just the OS is not serving my needs. So I'm excited to see where iPad OS goes. And I probably won't like it quite as much in the first version, but it might get to a point where it's close to Mac OS mm -hmm. a year or two down the road, you know? Yeah. So I believe you own iPad Pro. I do not have an iPad at all. Oh, I see. So are you no. contemplating to get an iPad Pro anytime soon? Well... I'm not sure I want to spend my own money. See, Apple and you know, the, Apple doesn't give me stuff, so yeah, yeah. I have to spend my own money. So I'd rather spend that money on a on a new MacBook. Frankly, mm -hmm. I'm waiting for an ARM MacBook. That's what I'm waiting for. Right. But if uh, you know, if uh, they make a new iPad next year, not Pro, that has very little bezel, and is three hundred, four hundred dollars, I might great. just buy one just <laughs> because of uh, iPad OS. Yeah. But, but it needs to be more modern than what they have now for the base. Yes, I agree. I agree. 
Because then I can justify, I can buy an iPad for $300, $400. Talking about the MacBook though, I really hope they redesign the whole MacBook lineup just because of the Me too. trashy keyboard. I, I hate it since Trashy keyboard, uh, really bad thermal management, there's all kinds of issues. I, I really hope that they revise things. I mean, remember, the chassis was for the Pro, MacBook Pro, was introduced in 2016. It is now 2019. <laughs> yes. Three years have gone by, three years of technology and improvements um, that the form factor is not capable of accommodating, you know? Mm, yes. That's my biggest gripe. I mean, the keyboard obviously needs a redesign, but even that is not a biggest challenge. I think the biggest challenge, if you watch Dave Lee's video, Dave 2D, oh, yes. you know, it's the thermals. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I want ARM-based Mac, like a, not a pro, but like a MacBook replacement. Yeah. <laughs> because the thermals won't be a problem. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. So the, uh, the ARM notebooks are mostly passively cooled? They do not have fans. Yeah, None yeah, of them do. Cooled. So this, this the demo that we saw at Qualcomm was a Saturday HCX with no fan beating an i5 with a fan. Shit. <laughs> and this amazing. is sustained. So before oh, everybody is taking their pitchforks in the comments here and says, well, oh, but that's just a benchmark. No, no, this is this is PC Mark 10. It's their new benchmark, which actually runs real apps. And the, the, the entire test runs for half an hour. So it's sustained. Mm -hmm. Right? You're going to start running into thermal throttling about 10 minutes in, right? Mm -hmm. Or so. And this thing runs for 30 minutes. So you're basically showing the behavior of a real computer using real work, doing a real job, and seeing how the thermals hold up. Pretty interesting times ahead, I must say. Well, you know, seven nanometer, the efficiency of ARM, mm -hmm. and you know, good passive cooling is gonna always beat Intel. Like, Intel has made the biggest mistake a few years ago, about 10, 15 years ago, when they sold Xscale. I, at the time, I was like, are you nuts? ARM is the future. Why are you selling your ARM division? <laughs> oh, because x86, 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 you know, here, have some x86 with your tea. <laughs> like, like, seriously, like, why are they so invested in this? They can continue making x86. I think x86 is great. I think it's good for servers and high-end workstations. But... Do we need it for everything? No. Like, did we need to all suffer from the Atom? Oh. There was so much suffering because of Atom. Oh, I, I remember those days, those dark days of Atom. <laughs> the dark days of Atom. There you go. That's the title for your podcast. <laughs> yes, because that was horrible. Atom was so it, bad. It was. <laughs> Just one last thing. Like, where can people find you on the internet? Although you have already told it in the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, Let's I'll go. tell it again. So um, I'm Tank Girl on Twitter and Instagram. That's T-N-K-G-R-L. It's like the comic book character Tank Girl, but without the vowels. If you remove the vowels, so it's T-N-K-G-R-L. You can find me on Twitter there and Instagram there. And if you go to Twitter, you can see my full name, Miriam Joar, Miriam with a Y, J-O-I-R-E. And you can put that together and add it to YouTube.com. So YouTube.com slash Miriam Joar to get to my YouTube channel, which has a lot of unboxing videos and review videos of the products I discuss on the podcast. And you're going to say, what podcast? Mobile Tech Podcast, mobiletechpodcast.com. That's my weekly show. That is my main gig. And you can go and subscribe on Google, Apple, Pocket Cast, Overcast, and TuneIn Radio, and even Spotify. So please subscribe. You have no excuse to not subscribe. You know where I am for everything now. And then finally, you know, I write reviews on various sites. So, like, if you want to read that OnePlus 7 Pro review, it's on geekspin.co. So check that out, geekspin.co. .co, one word. All right, that's it. All right, Miriam. It was really awesome having you over. And it was a good chat. It was a great chat, I must say. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I hope you had fun. <laughs> I did. And that's all for this week's episode. If you liked it, go ahead, like, share, subscribe, do your thing. And if you have any questions, queries, or even constructive criticism, go ahead and just tweet at me. It's at Shimon IPS. That is S H I M O N I P S. And hey, now you can even send me voice messages via Anchor. So go ahead, even if you're on your phone, PC or tablet, you can just send me a voice message and I'll get back to you. How awesome is that? Okay folks, that's all and I'll see you in the next episode.